Greetings and welcome to the Saroth the Mage Experiment. Tonight I have uh, a returning guest, although you didn't see his first interview, Dave Lee. How are you going, man? I'm good, thank you. And you? Uh, very well. I had a bit of a cold this morning, but I don't want to... And I was working, but hey, that's modern life. Yes. So, Dave, um, you were an original uh, of the uh, IoT, the Illuminates of Thanateros. How did it all start for you? I believe there was something uh, about your 18th birthday. That's not where Chaos Magic started for me, by any means. That was much, all right. much later. Okay. Um, I I'll, can go into that separately. But, uh, yeah, the involvement with magic really started in my mid-20s. And I was living in Leeds as a post-grad student. And uh, I was living not far from a, a shop called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Legendary. Uh, yeah, now they're a, a mail order business, and um, I went in there. And, I th and well, I was, you know, I, I was open to magic. There was a small meeting group at the university that eventually became the Leeds University Union Occult Society, and um, but I hadn't really kind of settled on a magical path that worked for me because I was a science kid and. Um, it was quite, you know, it was difficult to step outside of scientism. And so when I, a lot of stuff that I read in the, in the world of magic required that you already believed in God or angels or certain types of spirits and that kind of thing. And um, I, I wasn't prepared to, you know, I, I just wanted to see what happened. I, want, I, I knew there was something going on because of my late teen psychedelic experiences. But um, I didn't know how to articulate this until I came across Chaos Magic. And uh, through going, yeah, I went to Sorcerer's Apprentice and they started having coffee mornings on a Saturday morning. You go in, pay a, pay a small sum of money and get a plastic cup of instant coffee and fill it from the table <laughs> and um, sit around and talk. And I met Ray Sherwin and Pete Carroll there. So that's one of the places that where Chaos Magic crystallized. It's very much Leeds, very much Leeds where it did crystallize because um, Ray Sherwin was living in a village near Bradford, East Morton, and Pete Carroll worked visiting him around the same time. This is the late 70s, I think we're talking kind of 78, 79. And in 78, first edition of Lieber Null came out by Pete Carroll. And I read that and I thought, this is the stuff for recovering scientism victims, you know, people who've been in our, our scientism culture, um, anti-esoteric culture. And so that, that, it, it all came together, both the book and shortly afterwards, uh, the meeting group. One of the other things that got things going was uh, Ray Sherwin inviting people to his place to form a new magical group. To, to his village. So um, there's a few things that came together at the same time. Leeds University Union Occult Society, um, Sorcerer's Apprentice, and uh, Pete Carroll and Ray Sherwin inviting people to a group in uh, this little village. So yeah, that's what got it together. So in um, larger cultural terms, you know, Britain in the late 70s, quite a depressing place. Um, the National Front were holding marches. Um, the, the sort of hippie dream of the 60s had evaporated. Um, were you aware at the time that you were doing something deliberately new? Uh, it certainly felt like that. It felt new. It felt experimental. Um, I remember when I was, uh, you know, in, in my late teens when I was doing acid um, for a couple of years, um, one of the phrases from a song that stuck with me was from a Jefferson Airplane song where Grace Slick, sing, Slick sings, I'm doing things that haven't got a name yet. <laughs> in my mind, I thought, yes, that's what I want to do, things that haven't got a name yet. And it's some, you know, a few years later, but when Chaos Magic started to crystallise, that uh, I felt like I was beginning to do things that hadn't got a name yet. And also another quote that, that slots into this, because, of course, one of the... One of the massive inputs, I'll, I'll just turn that thing off. Um, one of the massive inputs into Chaos Magic was the work of Robert Anton Wilson, the Illuminatus novel, which kind of had an implicit thing of what he later called multi-model agnosticism. And then, of course, his Cosmic Trigger books, which were explicitly laid out the idea of multi-model agnosticism. 
And he thought, you know, there was that cartoon he put together, which was some kind of like science dude on one side and a hippie on the other, a uh, dividing line yeah. down the middle. And the caption was, hey, man, are you only using half your brain? <laughs> and um, that was another thing I was thinking, yes, you know, doing things I haven't done aim yet, using both sides of my brain, you know, this is exciting stuff. Yeah, it's quite uh, unusual in a way, I think, for someone with a um, hard science background, if you like, to go into uh, something as um, esoteric and weird as ritual magic. And do you think that informed your practice, having oh, the science background? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's more than just informing my practice. It's very much part of what I was, you know, when I was a kid. It was, um, I remember when I first gave up magic, I was about four, and I stood with my dad looking at a row of shops, and he's asking me what I wanted for my birthday, and my, my forthcoming birthday, and I said, I want a magic wand. I want one like Sooty's got that can do real magic. And my dad regretfully informed me that magic wasn't real, and that, you know, Sooty was kind of an exception. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I thought, oh, yeah, I don't remember being like shocked or hurt or anything, but I was taken aback. I can still vividly remember this row of shops and standing beside my dad at about the age of four. And um, so that's the first time I gave up magic. And I, I think it was after, you know, it was not long after that. Well, well, I went to school not long after that. And the subjects that interested me and excited me were the science subjects. And I also found them easy to do. I was naturally motivated. So it's quite a deep part of who I was, really. And in terms of how it informed my practice, I think early chaos magic was ready made for people who were from a science background to step right into. Because it's like, you know, keep a magical diary, keep a record of things. Everything's an experiment. So there was that sort of approach to it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the two major forms, I mean, they're basically the same, uh, Golden Dawn and then Thelema is kind of a Crowleyan twist on the Golden Dawn system. So had you encountered these systems before you met Ray and Phil? Yes, I had, yeah. We'd, um, this, we had this little meeting group at the Student Union, um, some undergrads and postgrads that were interested in magic. And... Um, the, often Crowley came up a lot in conversation, of course, because Crowley sits right across the British occult scene, or certainly did at the time, still does to a large extent. He's just such a prolific writer, somewhat verbose, but with some really good mm -hmm. ideas and with a core of really interesting stuff there. And um, so I'd yes, definitely come across Crowley, but Thelema struck me as, it's, again, it was something you had to invest belief in from the start. You know, it was kind of like, oh, okay, this is this is the new religion, as it were. Similarly, Wicca. I felt the same about Wicca. I wasn't I wasn't looking for a religion. Um, the other current that was around was the kind of post Dion Fortune um, Kabbalah, um, certainly Crowley influenced, but um, moving off in a slightly different direction. And I worked with some friends about a year or two after that those first years. I, I collided, well, well, during those first years, I collided with a group that was doing that kind of stuff, and I got involved with that as well in parallel to the chaos magic thing. Because in a way, the chaos magic thing in its early form, um, the Pete Carroll form, where it's, you know, okay, it's for people recovering from scientism, but it's got a lot of science-like features to it, um, where, you know, there was very little, there was very little work there's very little discourse about inner states of, you know, and higher consciousness, such as, for instance, you've got in Kabbalistic groups where the whole thing is about climbing the tree of life to supreme consciousness at Ketha. So there was a discourse that I thought was missing from the early chaos magic stuff that that, that supplied that too. Yeah, it was very pragmatic. I remember... I as a as a teenager, um, I got interested through art and poetry um, mm -hmm. into Alistair Crowley, and uh, there was only one bookshop that had any. I mean, Aberdeen still was a bit of a, a wasteland uh, intellectually, so there was one little comic bookstore that sold uh, New Falcon and uh, Samuel Weiser titles. So I was able to get Robert Anton Wilson, Israel Regardi, Crowley, and then one beautiful day. Uh, Lieber Null and Psychonaut appeared on the shelf and it just looked radically different 
And when I took it home, I wasn't familiar with Austin Osman's spear or any of that. So it really was like, wow, this is for me because I am a skeptic, you know. I don't believe just in any old nonsense, but Lee Bernal and Psychonaut seem to, you know, they emphasize this idea of gnosis and, and mm. how you enter that gnosis. I think they even give an equation for it, if I remember correctly. An equation? Oh, later on, Pete yeah. Carroll developed the equations of magic, which I think are actually completely useless for magical practice. <laughs> I don't want, you know, I, yeah. I really don't get why he bought Yeah, you need this amount of gnosis to do this. Yeah. Yeah. They're all they're all things you can't measure, so they're not true equations. They're kind of they're, they're pseudoscience equations, I'm afraid for me. But yes, the idea of gnosis being core. I think the other idea that was core to chaos magic was um, shifting belief, which of course does come from Robert Anton Wilson. The idea that um, in order to have the richest experience of our life possible, we've got to be able to move fluidly between different belief systems. So you're going to work in the day as, say, you work in the law, then you've got law, legal framework to think in. You go home to your girlfriend, boyfriend, significant other, and you're a lover, a partner. That's a different. That's a different reality. You write an article for, you know, these days an online magazine, and you're in a mode of maybe almost journalist or blogger or whatever. You um, you do a magical uh, working, and you've got to one hundred percent believe that this is that, that you are a magician. So your role becomes that of a magician, and yet at the end of it you're banished with laughter or whatever, and you may go and read a book on physics or you know, go back to work or whatever. We, and if we restrict ourselves to just one belief system, such as scientism or Catholicism or Buddhism or whatever, uh, without any input, without any possibility of moving outside of that frame, we just squash our life down to a sort of Procrustean bed of just one set of possibilities. So the idea of multimodal agnosticism is to, is to say, well, I don't know absolutely for certain that anything I believe is completely true, but I'm going to believe in it as much as I can on, you know, for a couple of hours now or every Tuesday or for a week and then stop believing in it and so on and so forth. So that shifting of belief into magical belief, I think, is one of the really important core ideas in chaos magic. And Gnosis enables that to a large extent. If you've been dancing or meditating or um, anything else that gets you high, breathing in a different way, for instance, then it will be easier to slip into a magical a belief in the reality of magic and that you're a magician. Mm -hmm. So when did you, you know, being from a science background, you obviously want to see some kind of result. Uh, what, when did you realise that magic actually worked? I think, um, well, yes, uh, I, I had some random experiences, which I would count as magical back in my late teens when I was you know, taking acid and just hanging out and doing crazy stuff. I mean, I'd seen energy stream across the room from my hand and so forth. And uh, so and this, so I knew that things like this could happen. But it, a, a few more years before I, I thought, OK, I've got to get down to a discipline of consistent work here and see, see what happens with it. Um, somewhere around my mid twenties, somewhere which is kind of like the you know the late seventies, I started to um, do do experiments. I'd say you know do a sigil to get back in touch with someone who I'd lost contact with, and then all of a sudden I've got her phone number. Um, <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I, other little things like that. I was thinking, this is working, isn't it? And you get a run of you get a run of beginner's luck, and a lot of magicians have that. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah, you've had that, yeah. yeah. I've had it, yeah. You get it with sigils, you get it with, if you decide to, you know, to if you buy some book that tells you to pray to some particular spirit, you're going to get a beginner's luck with that. It's naive belief. Naive belief is immensely powerful. And, of course, after a while, you start to, we naturally, your critical mind starts to deconstruct the belief, and you go, oh, is that how it works? And then your, your result, you know, your, your, your hit rate goes down and then you have to sort of like <laughs> work around that, steer around that and try again and then it will go up again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think sigil magic was, uh, I mean, it's chaos magic. Did you realise at the time how important um, the work that you were doing with Ray and Phil 
was going to be. I mean, it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon now, chaos magic. Um, that, that's an interesting question. I don't think I was looking that much to the future, really. I was looking at what I needed. And I was looking at belonging to a community of people who were talking about things in a similar way. You know, what's nowadays called a discourse community, where you get support because you've got similar experiences and a similar language to discuss them. Could you explain the mechanism of the sigil? Uh, it would be good to hear it from uh, an original. Uh, Ooh, what is yeah. the mechanism of sigils? Well, um, OK, um, if you want, once you start asking about magical mechanism, you're on very slippery ground. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview, if I may. Yes, of please. What, what some people say about this. I think one of the most um, useful models or, or discourses about how magic works was one put together by um, a German magician, Ralf Tegmeier, who's also known as Frater, oh, yeah. Yeah, Frater UD. He wrote a book on sex magic, he wrote a book on sigils, he's, he's written a fair few books that have been translated into English, he's mainly, he obviously writes in German, but he, he came up with, you can find this online somewhere, he came up with an idea of five magical paradigms, as he called them. I mean, some people would question the use of the word paradigm in this context, maybe model would be better, but I, let's switch between them and, and say they're pretty much the same thing. And um, So let's take our sigil, how does it work? Well, the... When Chaos Magic first started out with books like Lieber Null and um, Ray Sherwin's Book of Results, um, particularly with Pete Carroll's work, you have what I think we could call a psychologistic model. This is one of the models that Techmeyer mentions is it's psychological. In other words, in a certain sense, it's all in the mind, but your mind is much, much bigger and more powerful than you thought. So in other words, what you're doing is you're, disengaging your normal narrative mind, the normal sort of babble of, oh, did I leave the oven on? Oh, I, I wonder if yeah. I so took that wrong when I said that. And, oh, what shall I, you know, what shall I have for, for dinner tomorrow? And things like that. It's like um, all of that general sort of narrative babble. And which, of course, there's a lot of that I, I, I in there. So a lot of that is constructing identity. That stuff, you actually, using Gnosis, you sink down out of that to some extent. So that you, um, by meditation or by excitation, you know, either by um, so-called inhibitory gnosis. Yeah. Or excitatory, yeah, there's, there's got two. Gnosis. So dancing, um, having a few drinks and going a bit crazy and, or, you know, sex, for instance, all sorts of things that excite you. If you, um, breathing, I, one of my favourite and handiest forms of gnosis is you know uh, rapid continuous breathing these things will at a certain point you will your thoughts will start to recede into the background a bit and you'll start to you know feel that you are something bigger than that something other than thoughts something bigger than thoughts uh, thoughts are just a little subset of and when you get to that stage if you put a sigil into that then the psychology model says, well, what's what's happening there is that the sigil is an instruction to your deep body mind system that says, this is what I want. And you then forget about it. And your deep body mind system, which is where all the power is, sorts it out. This is this model is similar to what um, I don't know whether my this friend of mine created another image of magical action in the mind, but um or whether he borrowed it from someone else. Have you come across this one, the monkey and the elephant? You yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah. The, so. It's probably an older one than my friend, uh, than my, than, than my friend's um, publication of it. But yeah, basically, the conscious mind is a monkey sitting on top of an elephant. It's the elephant, you know, and occasionally sort of like prodding or pulling on the elephant and thinking it's steering the elephant, which to some extent it may be a little bit steering the elephant, but most of the time, frankly, it's the elephant that's doing it all. The elephant is the deep body mind system. The monkey is the tiny little bit on top, the conscious mind. So once you let go of the sort of monkey mind and you let the elephant do its thing, you let the deep body mind system radiate out whatever it takes in some mysterious way to get your sigil to work. So that's the psychology. That's the sigil looked at from the point of view of the psychology model. It, that's, that is the most respectable of the five paradigms because that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to go terribly far outside of scientism 
to engage with that one. Let's look at the least respectable next, the spirit model. And it's probably the oldest. You know, this is everything from ancestor worship through to belief in gods and goddesses, angels, um, demons, nature spirits, etc., etc., etc. In the spirit model, um, in the spirit model, everything's sentient to some degree, so that um, this pen has got a very, very low level of sentience based on, you know, based on the materials it's made from. Um, the tree out there has got a much higher level of sentience. It's a much more complex living thing. Um, so everything has got some degree of sentience, and you can ascribe sentience to things. So if I keep on, if I put this pen aside and start talking to it very specially, eventually it's going to become a magic pen, and then it will acquire more sentience. It's kind of added value sentience. So in the, in the spirit model, what's happening is that your sigil is a sentient thing. You've created a tiny little... You, you, you've, you've, you've pulled together elemental spirit energy and put it and formed it into something which has got its own, you know, semi-autonomous existence. And so what you're doing in the spirit model is you're sending the sigil off to do something for you. In the energy model, um, which is moderately respectable, I mean, a lot of people in scientism and culture do qigong and so forth and connecting, well, some do connected breath work and have, have energy experiences and so forth. Um, it's what's happening there is that you've, 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 your gnosis has enabled you to contact the energy of the deep body mind system, the avam or chi or prana, and you're blasting that through a portal, which is the sigil. Oof. And, um, you know, it's going out there and doing stuff. Um, and finally, there's the information model, which everybody's got a different understanding of. It's a sort of half understood model such that um, the information model, everything is information. So it's a little bit like simulation and emulation. The idea that, you know, it's uh, Johnson's paradox, Lionel Snell's idea that are we living in a simulated universe? The probability is that we are as long as we believe that we can be, then the probability is that we are. So the information model overlaps with the idea of a simulated universe, but it also overlaps with every idea of um, underlying reality, right back to Plato's cave. You know, it could be that there's a realer reality behind this and it's information. And in that model, I think you connect up with things and you send patterns of information out. And those patterns of information do things. So the sigil is a little blob of information that will then radiate out and cause changes to happen. That goes with the early, I think one of the reasons why um, this, this current got called chaos magic is that... Um, which is probably, which Ray Sherwin claims that he named it actually. I think it's quite possible. Um, I don't think it was Pete Carroll, because in his first edition of Libanon, it's the, the, the phrase isn't in there. But I think part of the impulse for calling it chaos magic was the idea of chaos maths and the butterfly effect. Yeah, you know, the absolutely. Mandelbrot set and all of that. That was around in the mid to late 70s. And computers then were just getting to the point where, you know, you could... Uh, some people even, you know, all right, you didn't have PCs as such, but there were still enough computers around to be able to draw nice pictures of Mandelbrot sets, which impressed everybody because they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they're an incredibly simple formula that gives a really rich pattern. So, and the butterfly effect, you know, that famous thing, butterfly flapping yeah. its wings here, thunderstorm in Texas or something. Um, this is a crude ex way of, you know, crude example for a, a profound idea that, that lots of systems in life, lots of systems in the world, are radically unstable, but they're, they're actually deeply chaotic, and they are not starting from any particular condition, set of starting conditions. They're starting from anywhere. So if you put a ripple into that, then you'll have an effect. So the information paradigm is saying you're creating a little ripple here, and it's going out having an effect in the world. So that's four different, <laughs> four mm -hmm. different answers to your question there. Yeah. Well, that's what I loved about uh, Chaos Magic. It, it wasn't uh, stuck to one model. Um, uh, another important idea, I think, in um, Chaos Magic was the idea of bypassing the psychic sensor. Uh, could you tell me your understanding of the psychic sensor, that bully that lives in our brain? Yeah. Um, 
Yes, this is, uh, this is popular in early discourse. I was never that impressed with the idea because it was as if, you know, people seem to be, people that wrote about it, I think Ray Sherwin might have introduced it in his early, early book, um, Book of Results. Um, it was as almost as if it's something that is just naturally there. And I'm not sure it is naturally there. I think that this, if there's a psychic sensor, it's a cultural one. We live in a culture which is anti-esoteric. Um, and, you know, what, what we call scientism, you know, treating science like a religion is the basic culture of, of our culture, the basic religion of our culture. Um, previous to that, we had Christianity, for instance, in the West, in Europe, and um, that was that was also anti-esoteric, of course, but perhaps not in the same way and perhaps not quite as strongly as scientism. So whether you're dealing with the dominant paradigm in the culture now, dominant religion, scientism, whether you're dealing with the leftover bits of Christianity, you, when you do magic, you're resisting, you're resisting official reality, as it were. And that is what the psychic sensor is, I think, is, is official reality. Some people say that it's to do with survival. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding of it, that, yeah. you know, um, paranormal happenings are not necessary for us to eat sleep reproduce etc so it just filters it out it won't it won't allow you to see a spirit in the corner or a ghost in the the wardrobe i'm not sure that's true you see i think that in um for instance in 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 societies where there's a what which we call shamanic where there's um you know at least one magician per small village of people a small community then you and you've got an acceptance of the importance of magic for hunting and and so forth and for knowing when to um, plant crops or to move the uh, to, to migrate onwards to your next hunting ground or to your next you know to your next pastures so i think that uh, the idea that magic is anti-survival is 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 again an artifact of our current culture yeah that's a good point so yourself um I take it you did like proper um, kind of grimoireish ritual magic in the early days. In, not in the early days. In the early days, it, it was it's difficult to know what to do. It's one of the oddest things. Is that in those well, maybe not so much now. There's so many suggestions around. I mean, you only have to get on the internet. You could download you know a thousand rituals in a day and pick pick one, but um, or or you know, pick and mix, make your own up out of out of things that you construe from those, but. There wasn't much in those days, and so we did all sorts of things. We did Kabbalistic path workings. They were a popular one. Like I said, that was more on the Dion Fortune sort of side, but somebody sits there and reads out a path working, and somebody's composed, and everybody else sits there with their eyes shut and goes on a, a virtual journey, an imaginary journey, and has perhaps emotional and spiritual experiences or visions. It can be quite interesting. Then there was the kind of... At the earliest days, um, there was also the kind of, OK, let's just do a sigil and just really get as nasticated as we can. You know, really like <laughs> nasticated. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Raise with the sigil and then burn it and like, do a lot of shouting and then have a laugh and everything and see what happens. And it was only later on that I got into the Grimoire stuff personally. Maybe other people took a different route, but it was... It was another 15 years before I picked up any of the grimoire material, really. Well, uh, could I ask which grimoires you were particularly interested in? Oh, we were just, I was with a group in the Midlands, in Birmingham, that was working with, um, it was working with uh, Goetic spirits, you know, so we, we'd, um, we, we were fairly formal about it. We had a circle, a triangle, um, uh, a pentacle round, you know, a pentacle round your neck, pentacle of Solomon, and all that sort of stuff, all the sort of traditional protection stuff. Which, I mean, to my mind, it's such, it's quite hard. It, it's quite, it was quite a journey to get to the point where I could even believe in any of that sort of stuff, you know, that Solomonic pentacle stuff and so forth. So it was certainly not there at the beginning of my journey. But yes, that group existed for about a year, and it's very interesting. You know, we we met about once every month or a little bit longer and um in a room above a pub in central birmingham oddly enough <laughs> done by a very tolerant landlord who himself was an initiate of an african esoteric tradition so wow. yeah <laughs> we had some interesting discussions with him and he didn't mind us 
um, that as long as we didn't leave chalk marks on the carpet in the uh, <laughs> sort of room, we didn't mind us doing that. But that was interesting. I had, I had some interesting experiences from that. Absolutely useless for results magic, I found. It was mm -hmm. absolutely useless. I got almost no positive results, but I did get some crazy dreams, and I saw one impossible thing happen, uh, a miracle, you know. And um, that was the uh, – I wrote about this a little bit in, um, in my book, right from the well and the section about um, you know a modern magician and it was we got quite a large circle i think there was five of us within it so it had to be quite a large circle and then a triangle and we called up a couple of spirits that, that evening and then there was the final big one and the mt of our of our group of our temple he was in charge then and he got this beautiful big tibetan purba yeah sort of three triangular section dagger quite a thing about that long Mm, beautiful. Um, made of bronze, a rather beautiful, wow, um, bronze. rather beautiful one. And uh, he was, you know, he was, uh, this was in the circle, he was in the circle, and he was talking to the spirit, and it was getting uppity. And this, is, this happens with goetic spirits. They, they can get uppity. They can, they can really decide they want much more than they're being mm -hmm. So this spirit starts to try and kind of like get out of the triangle and have a go at, um, at our MT. So he reaches for his purba, and it's not there. Mm. And then it's suddenly in his hand. It had moved about five feet, not through the air, but it was instantaneously in one place, and then it, went his, then it was in his hand, and he was pointing it at the spirit, and he got what he needed. So, the, you know, the charge, the energy that had built up during that, during that couple of hours of work was so great that it enabled, I mean, it was, it was the classic chill in the air and everything, you know, energy was being sucked out of everywhere to cause this instantaneous translocation of this heavy object. So, yeah, that was the most interesting experience I had with going. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's uh, breaking the rules of physics. Indeed, yeah. So um, did you ever conjure anything to visible appearance? I've often wondered if this is ever um, even possible. Well, people talk about that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, what, what it amounts to is inducing a hallucination, isn't it? I mean, you, you can talk with a spirit without seeing it with your physical eyes. Um, if you, you know, if, if you have enough smoke, it makes it easier to hallucinate shapes in it. So burning tons and tons of incense. Um, if you're on the right drugs, you can hallucinate like <laughs> But then, of course, your control is probably lower. And so, you know, you might pay quite uh, dearly for the experience of simply seeing it. Um, I was in a, I've been in circles where, on a couple of occasions that I can remember, where there's a momentary vivid glimpse of something that somebody else had called or projected, which is later on backed up. But I wouldn't say that um, – I've not tried really hard to come to visible, visible appearance. I think it's yeah. useful activity, really. Yeah. So talking about altered states of consciousness and uh, the fact that you'd, you'd used acid, I think you took a, your first trip on your 18th birthday, um, what do you think – I mean, there seems there's a direct um, correlation between – the doors of perception opening, if you like. My first magical experience was when I took psilocybin with a bunch of school friends whose older brother had said, yeah, see those things in the field there, if you pick them. Uh, we just ate them raw, and then we've yeah. refined the method since. But there seems to be just this inextricable linking between psychedelics and magic. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, like I say, I was a science kid, and then you know, from 18, between the ages of 18 and 20, I did quite a lot of acid. And um, the, the first trip on my 18th birthday was a very mild one. But even that kind of like jogged me out of science. It was like out of scientism. I've never been out of science completely. I just, you know, but it jogged me out of scientism. It's sort of, wow, excuse me, I'm not, you know, the Cartesian duality of mind and body just seemed completely and utterly ridiculous. I'm a field of energy, one part of which happens to be the experience of having a body, another part of which happens to be the experience of having a conscious self. Um, but no way is the you know, the Cartesian mind-body duality make any sense at all after that. And then I had some far more intense experiences. Like I say, I saw energy flows come out of my fingers and so forth. And, uh, Didn't you zap a cat once? Yes, that's what I've written about. 
was it was so vivid. <laughs> and one of my main specialities in magic over the last few decades has been so-called energy magic, the utilization of gnosis to produce um, a sense of energy and then the use, you know, the control of that energy to heal or do whatever. Um, but yes, I was uh, on quite a high dose of acid. We were testing out some, a new batch, as it were. You know, somebody uh-huh. put this round and said, yeah, "Yeah, have a go with this." And so it's pretty strong. And, and this, you know, me and my friend were just sitting there and trying to play a game of go, but it, everything was warping so much that it was. Quite <laughs> good. And at a certain point, I had this impulse to just flick my hand and see what happened and this sort of jagged you know boiling lightningy stuff just like in doctor strange <laughs> off of my hand and shot across the room wow and it would have just have been another hallucination had it not been for the fact that it hit his cat the cat sort of jumped you know jumped quite a lot into the air and then got out of the room via the window so sort of checking that the cat was all right it's absolutely fine because i mean i like cats you know i didn't want to it. um no, I wasn't even. I wasn't particularly pointing out. I wasn't doing anything really, sort of, you know, sort of abrupt that would have startled it. So I had an experience then of an absolute experience of seeing energy leave me and hit another being. So it's funny how we process these things. So I mean, it was a number of years before I before I stepped into full, you know, a full on belief in magic from that. But at the time, it certainly it. it it was a number of experiences like that started to pick away at my scientism so that I knew that that science was just one way of apprehending the world and that there were other ways which were which were different and some of them were richer. Absolutely. Uh, scientism is uh, very dry and, um, and, you know, not very interesting. Um, where was I going with my next question? Yeah, as you survey... Uh, 21st century or culture, which is now a bit of a buzzword, you know, um, and through the internet, probably more people are talking about magic, practicing magic than ever before. Where do you see it leading, if anywhere? Um, I wouldn't like to answer that for the wider culture, but I do, I do think we've got something going with a bit of a real surge in the magical revival in the last few years, a massive surge. A friend of mine runs um, an art gallery and bookshop in, in Sheffield, and she said that over the year that the lockdown started, just before the lockdowns, and her sort of accounting year from that included the beginning of the lockdowns, basically last year, um, her book sales doubled, her magical book sales doubled. And um, not from extra advertising or anything, but just people constantly sort of coming into the shop or emailing her and saying, have you got such and such? And she'd order it in for them. And I think as well, at the same time, when I was discussing this with her, we were talking about the surge in so-called conspiracy thinking. I oh, mean, yeah. It's a lo- I know it's a loaded phrase. It, it, it can be used to dismiss your opponent's argument, saying, oh, that's conspiracy theory. So I know it's a loaded phrase, but so that's why I, I put scare quotes on it. It's um, people believing in really stupid crap like QAnon and so forth. And I was just about to say QAnon, and yeah. it's just a rehashing of the blood libel from 500 years ago. Exactly. This is all stuff that, you know, this is from the 1890s, this kind of stuff. It's like it's been around forever and people don't know their history and, and they don't know you know, particularly the history of this kind of thinking. So they don't know that they're not being given something new. But there was something about this time. But I, I see that so-called conspiracy thinking as being ma- magical thinking minus cr- critical faculty. Um, you know, going back to that Robert Anton Wilson idea of multimodal agnosticism, we've each got a number of selves within us. You know, we've got the magician and we've got the critic, so two, two, or two examples. And um, when we start, when we decide to get into magic, when we want to live a magical life, then what we have to do is we have to knock the critic off its perch to some extent. We have to get away from that critical thinking in order to open up to what else is going on in life. But then at the end of the day, we have to bring the critic back in and have a look at what happened there. Whereas, you know, so we can move in and out of full on magical thinking. Whereas that's, 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 you know, and magical thinking can be, I suppose it can be threatening to our mental health when we first start. Well, it is actually classed as a mental illness, magical thinking. 
Yeah, in the in that what's it called the DMS that that big yeah. manual of psychiatry. It's a magical yeah. thinking. Is one of in, that that means you're crazy if you do magical mm -hmm. thinking. You believe that your will, your thoughts, are connected to the world in non-obvious ways. And um, but of course, that's what you've got to get into if you want to live a magical life. You've got to get into apophenia. You've got to get into seeing patterns where nobody else can see patterns, and um, making connections where nobody else makes connections. This is absolutely vital, this magical thinking, in order to become a magician. But you need to be able to move back into the critical perspective as well, whereas a QAnon person is, 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 is someone who's like just shot their critic in the head and killed them. <laughs> um, you know, so that's the difference. So I think um, with and without the benign, the benign balanced effects of the critic, we've had a massive surge in various kinds of magical thinking in the last few years. This fits in with Lionel Snell's model that everything goes in cycles. You know, that you've got four basic mm -hmm. ways. Humans have got four basic ways of apprehending reality, science, magic, religion, and art. And they go round in a cycle in a particular order. I really would recommend his book, My Years of Magical Thinking, um, you know, for his most in-depth um, exposition of this even though it goes back to his very first book ssotbme he lays those big ideas out what is it secrets of the sex magicians uh, deliberately um... yeah, something like that sex um, sex secrets uh, of the black magicians yeah sex secrets like that, yeah. Black magicians exposed or something yeah. isn't it he didn't tell anybody for quite a while what <laughs> or just to, you know a nice bit of a confusion there but yeah the idea that there's these four basic trends in human in human thinking therefore in human culture and they cycle around and you know there's cycles of 500 years 2000 years like aeons and all that but there's also much smaller cycles of just a few years and i think we've been hitting a magical thinking cycle for the last few years and so on lionel's prediction the next one would be art wouldn't it i think it goes magic art religion science, science yeah. yeah so the next one would be um, an explosion of, uh, of artistic thinking. Fantastic. I, I, I hope it does. Um, well, I often think, you know, the, the printing press was instrumental in the Renaissance, you know, because uh, normal people, everyday people could access written works, pamphlets and stuff like that. And I think the internet is the printing press bigger, you know what I mean? So sure. Sure. are we in for a, a, a magical Renaissance? Um, where magic actually is instrumental in explaining parts of the world that science can't or part of our human experience? Well, I think we are in, we are in a magical revival. We're in a magical um, renaissance at the moment, and it's been going on for some years. And I like I say, I think it's peaked particularly recently. As for the overall effects on culture, I'm sceptical of, of magic ever becoming mainstream because it's so much effort. Basically, even magicians say this, if you can get something without using magic, then don't use magic. Exactly, you know, yeah. um, it is, it's difficult. And the training required to actually become an effective magician is, you know, it, it's at times a bit grueling and it's certainly threatening to your mental health from time to time you know you have to sort of like you're constantly sort of moving in and out of you need a community you need a really good discourse community or you need a ridiculously good psychotherapist with speech. <laughs> otherwise you you know you're you're always along the edge a little bit of going crazy so i don't think that magic is ever going to be a completely mainstream thing it's always going to be a minority thing and in some respects that's good i mean if they if they if if the mainstream starts to believe in magic, then it's going to get reflected in the legal process, and we're going to get busted. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, I I often thought that um, well, Robert Anton Wilson certainly uses uh, Schrödinger's cat, you know, the quantum theory thing, as a, a possible explanation of how magic works. Now that we've uh, you know. Uh, moved on, say, 40 years. What do you think about the the quantum idea and if at all it, it explains magic or, or anything like that? I don't really try. I don't really... I'm not that bothered about explaining magic, really. Um, I don't think it's that necessary to make magic respectable in, a, in you know, using science. 
It's all people always do this. It's fun. I mean, in the 1890s, it was vibrations. You know, it was, uh, it was Maxwell's equations had given us the idea that that light and energy travels in a sort of regular vibratory patterns. And we're still using the term good vibes, you know. So um, <laughs> I'm sending you a vibe now, all that sort of stuff. People still say that. And that's like over 100 years old, that model. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor for magic, basically. And I think quantum, quantum, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum ontology and epistemology, I think, are, are, are metaphors for magic rather than explanations. So um, the other two things I wanted to talk about were um, your breath work, which I know you're very ex expert in, and uh, your work with runes. So uh, it's up to you which one you take on first. Well, I'll, I'll get into them in that order, actually. The breath work, um, I, um, I, obviously I did the basic pranayama exercises you do for basic magical training, but I've never been... I had any really impressive experiences with working with breath until I went to an event of Lionel Snell's at um, the public part of the IoT World Meeting in a castle in Austria <laughs> in 1991. And um, there was a number of seminars that were the kind of public part, and then we had our private meeting. And um, Lionel took about 30 people, there was about 30 people attending, took us in this big room, took us through... Um, about a basic 20, 25 minute rebirthing breath work cycle, lying on the floor on a mat and just breathing continuously, sort of like, you know how with the usual pranayama we're given, it's kind of like inhale, hold, exhale, mm -hmm. pause. My finger's going the other way from what I want it to. <laughs> but anyway, so it's like a square wave. It sort of goes, I can't do this at all, actually, on this screen. <laughs> It's reversed. So. Yeah, square wave. You know, inhale, hold, exhale, pause. Four four stages to the breath. Whereas with connected breathing, it's just inhale and exhale. It's more like a sine wave. There's no holding and no pausing. So it's a very, very high energy breath. You flush the carbon dioxide. There's normally a layer of carbon dioxide in the bottom of our lungs, which hardly gets touched by each breath. Uh, if we do continuous connected breathing, it starts to get flushed out. This changes the blood pH and it changes the way your nerves fire as you get into an altered state. I was so impressed by this 20 minutes of uh, lying down doing this breathing. And I went through an emotional roller coaster, which was not entirely pleasant. So I was going through some difficult emotional stuff at the time anyway. But it was just to get to, get to that and then to come out of it with this high energy state still going. Wow, I couldn't believe it. So... When I got back to England, I found myself a breathwork coach and I had a few months of every two or three weeks, I would go and see him and do some, some coached work with him, which was very useful for me to work through some of my emotional stuff. I was so impressed by that, that I then decided to go on an actual training course. And I did a year's uh, training in qualified in vivation, which is one of the brands that came out of rebirthing breathwork. The two basic sources for all of this stuff. It's either holotropic breath work and all the brands that came out of that, or it's rebirthing breath work. And um, so in 1993, I qualified um, as a, a breath work coach. That's what we called usually a coach rather than because it's like not exactly therapy, even though healing effects happen. Um, it's more, it's, it's, it's work, but it's quite pleasant to do. In fact, it can be, it's mostly ecstatic and blissful to do. So it's more like, um, we call it coaching. So anyway, so I did that as taught, you know, solo, one-to-one, -one, helping somebody, being there for somebody while they, you, you were helping them maintain the breath patterns while they were going through some emotional release um, process cycle. And then a few years after that, I started coaching groups. I worked out ways to coach groups, which I hadn't been taught how to do. I just did it for myself because I was um, working occasionally with a, a collective in South London called Green Angels no longer exists. I mean, might exist online somewhere. But they had this sort of building that they had use of. And so in every Wednesday night, there was a sort of healing night. And so I used to go along and do some breathwork practice with everyone to turn up. So about a dozen people sit around in a circle, do some breathing. And I was astonished at how quickly people got into altered states when there was more people there, much more quickly. Mm. 
yeah and with solo work and also they would get into much more um kind of interestingly magical altered states they'd start seeing auras uh, if you draw if you lay back um, with your feet in the middle and hold hands and do the breathing where you can't see anybody else you're looking upwards if somebody releases their hands you know where it is in the circle you know where the break is and so you know wow you know not yeah, local, that's amazing. Non local consciousness happening through energy and so i started to experiment with um, energy healing and um collective energy work and there were some other people in the chaos magic world that were doing something similar that come up with something they called the ko trauma sort of jokey sci-fi name for a group of people in a circular formation passing energy around and you know all of these things came together as and i wrote a book about it a few years ago life force which is the longest and probably best book i've ever written actually because it took me years to write i was, I was going to write a book that was just all about breath work all the different styles of it um I tried, you know, as well as connected breath work, I tried, I think, another eight styles of breath work, mostly derived from pranayama, um, and wrote notes on them. And then I did courses on those and some online courses with people and and uh, asked permission to use their results as well. So I got amassed a number of anecdotal uh, experiences about different types of breathing patterns. So I was getting this ready, you know, to put into a book, and then that, the energy work just took off and took off and took off. So it had to be about breath and energy, and that's what the book eventually was. So yeah, that's been a major part of my my magical work for the last thirty years. Yeah, uh, if I could just, uh, I was reading a thing just today on I think it's Keotopia, your mm. uh, website. Is it called Keotopia? Keotopia dot com. Yeah. 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 About. Uh, undoing yourself uh, mm. could you explain what you mean by undoing yourself that is um that's an expression i nicked uh like everybody nicks these expressions i think it was uh christopher hyatt who yeah, i remember a, a book called undoing yeah. yourself with energize yeah. something yeah and basically the way i mean it is not massively different from the way he means it's a little bit different the way i mean it is really undoing your sense of self um when people talk about, and this is, this is about meditation, really. When people talk about meditation, they usually mean, well, they mean loads of different things, but it usually comes into two, excuse me, two, uh, two different things they're usually talking about. Either it's a case of you're sitting there and somebody's reading a capitalistic path working to you, you're going from Malkuth up the tree and so forth. So that visualization, um, that's visualization for spiritual or magical work. Or you can sit there and visualize the car you want to buy at a reasonable price. That's basic magic, you know. So when people talk about meditation, they mean a lot of different things. But when it involves visualization, that is a doing type of meditation. You're trying to get, and you're trying to, you're changing what you're doing in yourself, and you're trying to get the world to change what it is doing. Whereas when you do meditation, such as happens on vipassana retreats, have you come across those? Some people pronounce it vipassana. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, Mr. Goenka. Uh, he, you know, it, there's a lot of it around anyway. They're, they're, they're a big organization. And um, the Pasana is a, a Pali word that's usually translated as insight. And it, what, it, what it is insight into is not your problems or physics or the law or anything like that. It's insight into the structure of your moment to moment experience. And what happens is that if you meditate for long enough, you will gain insight into the structure of your moment-to-moment -moment experience as a conscious being. And this will lead to the undoing of your sense of selfhood. That's what I mean by self-undoing, really. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of the, I mean, everything reminds me of this model. I'm obsessed with it. The, the Eight Circuit, uh, Leary, um, Anton Wilson put it in his book, Prometheus Rising. Yeah. Do you think that's a valid idea that um, we have imprint vulnerability at certain stages in our life? Um, yes. And yeah, I, I do. I think yeah. it's a great model. I mean, whether or not you use the eight the eight circuit model as it stands or not, I mean, obviously, it leaves some things to be desired in some respects. But the basic idea that we're imprintable in, in various different ways is is an actual, definitely a core idea that's very valid. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I uh, swear by it. So uh, let's round off with uh, your work with runes, because I, 
for some reason, well, I was on a massive dose of psilocybin and I saw myself as a wizened old kind of Viking and I was covered in runes, so I prompted myself to get runes tattooed. Unfortunately, they are associated, I didn't know this when I got them, but um, like in certain countries, Sweden, I think, is banned runes because they're associated with neo-Nazis and all that, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. Well, just a, um, that, that's an interesting point, actually, the political dimensions of it. I don't, I don't think Sweden could ever ban runes because they've got the largest number of rune carvings in the world. They've got thousands of existing mm. rune stones. Some European countries yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Germany banned it because, um, because the Nazis did, did um, utilize the, the double, the double Sigel or Sowilo rune as the in for the SS and a few other things. I mean, the way I look at that is that. The runes are um, are part of Germanic esotericism, and that is a well. And just because some bunch of criminals and assholes are drawing water from the well to brew poison, doesn't mean that the well itself is poisoned. Yeah. And um, there are there is a tiny minority of people in Germanic esotericism who are Nazis and racists, um, but it, it is a tiny minority by and large. The you know the the runes are the way that most people use the runes. It's not like that at all. Yeah, I mean, my own my own interest was after the thing about chaos magic is that because you're always hopping from one paradigm to another, mm -hmm. you seldom study anything in depth. Mm -hmm. So I thought I want to study something in more depth. And so I looked at the things that that impressed me magically that I'd worked with, like the I Ching and Tantra and Voodoo. For instance, but I mean, you know, if you're going to learn the I Ching really, really deeply, you're going to have to learn Mandarin Chinese and go over there. If you're going to learn Voodoo really deeply, you're going to have to get initiated into a lineage, you know, and so on and so forth. Why make it hard for yourself? You know, I grew up speaking, my mother tongue is English, which is a Germanic language. So the natural way to go culturally is into Germanic esotericism. I don't think it matters, you know, what the colour of your skin is and where you were born. What matters is your cultural inputs. If you grew up learning English, then you've got an in, an easy in into Germanic esotericism. It's not that you can't, you know, if you, if you grew up learning Swahili or something, there's no reason why you couldn't study the runes deeply, but it would just be harder for you, just like it's harder for me to, to learn you know, to learn um, Taoist esotericism. But, um, so I thought, I want to study something really deeply. I want to really, like, immerse myself in something and go, I want to find a rabbit hole that I can go right, right down as deep and deep and deep as it goes. And, of course, what happens there, because it's about the location that I'm in as well. It's about, you know, it's about living in the place, not specifically living in England, but... Or, or even Great Britain, but living in the very local place that I live in and just looking at what the local history is, what the traditions are, what the stories are that follow on from where I live. And this enriches your life in a different way to what the paradigm hopping of chaos magic does. And, you know, the runes are part of that for me. It all happened very quickly, actually. I, I, I got a couple of... Um, you know how you're attracted to things by their apparent ideology. You know, you sort of think, oh, that organisation sounds interesting. But you don't join unless you like the people. I think that's important. You respect the people more than like them, although like, like is good too. And I had two friends, uh, um, Ian Reid and Ingrid Fisher. For, unfortunately, Ingrid is no longer with us, but Ian still is. They were working with the Rune Guild, and they were deep, deep students of... Um, of the runes and so forth back in the 90s and so I'd, i i got to know them through the chaos magic world they, they were um, they, they headed up the british section of the iot for a few years and um i liked them got on well with them respected their magic enormously so that there was a sort of an underlying thing of oh i'm interested in the runes even though i didn't really know much about them and then in 1995-96, I did a series of magical retirements, which was a culminate in the invocation of my holy guardian angel. Here we go, mixing paradigms again. Well, so, there you it, go. That's chaos magic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In 95, I, I walked about 45 miles over four days to Avebury along the Ridgeway in southern England, one of the most ancient tracks in, in, in England. And um, at Avebury, I invoked my holy guardian angel and 
took some acid and had a very vivid experience, had a vision of the Holy Guardian Angel. And, and mm-hmm. But weirdly enough, the whole thing sort of shut down over the next few days. I got to this amazingly high state, understood a lot of things about my own esoteric path. And then it all shut down as if, okay, that's all you're getting. Now you go somewhere else. And a couple of weeks after that, I went to visit my girlfriend's living in another town, a woman I was going out with at the time. And I drove straight from her place to this event that was happening in London, which was um, the, the uh, first time Edred Thorson, the head of the room girl, the, uh, had ever spoken in England. And I wanted to hear him speak. He was speaking at Charlton House in South London. So I drove there. And I parked up and I was a tiny bit late. So I was like rushing to lock the car, rush into the building. And he gave this talk, which was good. It was very inspiring. There was a couple of things I still remember about it. God, this I still remember about it. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> this is the path I can get with. And I started to realize that, you know, my, my holy guardian angel, if you like, my divine self had said, you know, had, had led had, you there. But okay, here we go. And when I came out of the place, oh, yeah, in the build up, that Goetic group I was talking about that was in Birmingham, um, I've been working with them not long before. And I've got a bag in the car with um, a Solomonic wand that I'd made and uh, the robe I used for those workings and a pantacle of that sort in this little bag in the car. And I didn't take it into the event with me. I left it in the car because I was in a hurry. And so, of course, it was visible on the back seat. I get out of the um, I get out of the talk and go to my car, and the little side light window has been smashed, mm-hmm. and the bag's been stolen. It's the only thing that's been stolen. So, whoever stole that stole a doing Goisha kit. So, you know, I hope the thief became enlightened by that. <laughs> so, well, yeah, or uh, haunted by demons for the rest yeah. of his life. But that just that was another part of the whole magic of it. It's as if my angel was saying, Right, here you go. You know, you don't need this stuff any longer, you're doing runes now, mate. So um yeah, so all of a sudden that was it. And I thought about it for a few more months and then joined the Rune Guild at the beginning of January nineteen ninety six. And uh, the runes are the uh, for divination or do they have a larger sort of um what's the word a larger sort of um use <laughs> for want of a better word oh yeah much larger use uh, divination is just one part of it um if you look at the existing rune carvings that are, that are there from you know, about a thousand early middle ages thousand years ago they are um generally memorial stones because obviously stuff carved on stone is the stuff that's going to last or they're the consecration of weapons in some cases so these are magical things, and divination is just one side of it. The earliest record we have of the use of runes, or something that sounds very much like runes, no doubt was, is Tacitus, the Roman uh, scribe who was with the um, Roman armies in Gaul and Germania, and he wrote this book called Germania, his report of you know of the Roman campaign in Germania, and um, he talked about people casting lots using um, slips of wood with signs drawn them from a fruit tree and then casting lots and, you know, in order to, to find things out. So there are ancient records of divination, but that isn't the primary purpose. That's just one of the purposes. Yeah, you can use them for divination. You can use them for enchantment. You can use them for doing active magic. You know, if I if I want to calm a situation down, I might reach for the rune Isa, which is like the I, letter I. It's just a single straight line, um, which is ice, so it's a contraction and calming and stilling so you see you get the idea there each rune has got a character and you can use that in your magic Mm -hmm. and do you work with uh the norse pantheon at all like odin freya uh those entities to some extent yeah to some extent um usually in group ritual work we will call on one or other of the those deities um there's I think rune magicians are naturally connected to Odin or Woden. Um, in in Voodoo, they talk about having a maitre de tete, having a god who is the master of your head. And if your yeah. if your main magic is runes, then Odin is the master of your head in a certain sense. So yeah. you're very much in contact with Odin. Well, funnily enough, um, I was on a recent trip. Uh, I'd been in a relationship and I'd been away from 
the woman that I worked magic with for years before that. We won't say why I couldn't contact her during the four years of my relationship. But uh, we recently got back to, to you know, meeting, not, not uh, completely platonic. And uh, we took a trip to Edinburgh. Uh, we did a, um, we do a big mushroom uh, sacred ceremonies sort of thing. And um, with the memories of Edinburgh still fresh in my mind, it became Odinburgh. Uh, oh, because wow. <laughs> because we'd been to Roslyn Chapel and I'd spoken to a friend that's very he's going to be coming on the channel soon, you know. And it really did. I, I, I got the feeling that Edinburgh was like the last bastion of pagan religion and all that. And uh, there was another bit to it too. Um, oh yeah, then we went to um, Stornoway to see the Callanish stones on the oh, wow, uh, yeah. yeah on the equinox. So that was uh, fabulous, brilliant. Uh, experience yeah wonderful mm. great stuff yes I, I i long to see the Callanish stones i've never seen them yet i'm hoping to go next summer superb they really are and, and where mm. i live in aberdeenshire i think it's got the most stone circles in possibly europe oh wow we've got a lot yeah yeah uh, have you ever seen uh, julian cope's book the modern antiquarian yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 the pages keep falling out unfortunately but um, yeah, we we did the tour, Sun Honey, and oh, that's fantastic! I'm a big fan of Julian Cope. There's a friend of mine who carves rune stones. He's an artist, very very highly skilled man, um, P. D. Brown, and he uh, he lives in Ellen in Aberdeenshire. Oh yeah, Ellen, yeah, that's yeah, just... and, uh, He's got, I think, he's just raised his seventh stone. So in that area, there's seven rune stones he's carved. Did you post a Facebook post about that recently? Yeah, it's got yeah, a... yeah, I. I, I you know, uh, shared one of his posts about it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I always do share his posts about his rune work. It's always so beautiful. Well, I'll maybe get to take a trip out there if you can uh, mm. give me an introduction. Okay, Dave, um, this has been fantastic. Um, I've been able to hear you this time, which has greatly That's enhanced good. our ability to, to actually talk to each other. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. Do you want to plug any workshops or, or the stuff that you're doing now? Um, well, I've actually taken a break from scheduling workshops because of the um, a lot of work to do on the physical plane. We're moving house, and there's a lot to do on the old house and the new house, and there's been so much to do that I thought I'm not going to schedule only for a few months. Um, but I've got um, a number of uh, courses that I've put up on um, my online school, Chaotopia School of Magic, which is on the Teachable. Uh, thing but all of that stuff is I, I believe I sent you a link tree you did uh, yeah link tree that, that, the link tree contains uh, all of my public facing um, links and um, the yeah so that there's lifetime access not you know non-mediated but lifetime access course course uh, coursework in Kyoto School of Magic um, and there's an, op an opportunity there also to join my to get onto my mailing list um, and I'll be sending out uh, a newsletter in about probably about three days. I send about six a year out. So um, yeah, the one in about three days to cover the, the first half of the winter. So um, yeah, that, that will have all the updates about what's, what's going on with my writings and courses and everything. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dave, for uh, coming back a second time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, I will be filling out my application for the IOT. Oh, splendid. Yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll meet you in person someday. Indeed, I hope so. Yes, I hope so, Steve. Okay, well, thank you very Great much, stuff. Dave. Thank you. It's been a blast. Peace, man. I'm going to end the recording now. Okay. Thank you very much, sir.